Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And yeah, I am going to stick to what I've been sticking to recently, which is XRP and particularly regulation, utility and corridors. You might be surprised if you haven't followed me for the last couple of years. I was originally doing a channel that focused on Bitcoin because Bitcoin to me was the most exciting digital asset I had ever seen. But then like many of you who are watching this, you came to learn, understand and got yourself educated about the company Ripple and the digital asset XRP. And it is by far doing the most progressive revolutionary work in this space uh than all of them in my opinion there are a few others and but really when it comes to focus i think xrp is the most interesting to follow so when i talk about uh this video and you're going to be surprised i'm going to do a video about monero later on this afternoon you'll find out why in that video but today let's get on it so let's talk liquidity Catherine Coley, she is uh, recently, yeah, she took the CEO position of Binance US for CZ, but she had a very good interview on Pomp's podcast last month. And at the 14 minute mark, she talks about how she was hired by Ripple for two years to make XRP as liquid as possible. So why do we always focus or talk about liquidity? Well, the more places that XRP can easily be bought and sold, the more corridors can go live with XRP as a bridge currency, providing that on-demand liquidity or ODL as it is often referred to. And this is kind of funny, this is Wikipedia they're using this old church as an example in the UK as having low liquidity. And because it's not easy to sell, the price is low. That is also why we see a huge, huge focus on the tokenization of illiquid assets. Particularly 10 days ago, I did a video about Securitize. Not only did Ripple and their arm Spring invest in Securitize, but also Mr. Kitao of SBI, the CEO, put in a, an investment that has six zeros. It's an undisclosed amount, but we know that it has six zeros. It is pretty amazing. So I think when you look at liquidity, let's get back to that interview. Um, Catherine Coley talks about this scrappy team that she was in. And they looked at the five to six trillion dollar daily volume done in the FX market. Now, if Ripple, the company, was going to make this kind of volume with XRP, they needed to have much more liquidity and they needed to do it with quality mechanisms. So that liquidity comes from exchanges, OTC desks, market makers, retail investors, funds, and also something that Ripple is starting to focus on, which is corporate flow. This is where you have consistent payouts that repeat from not only SMEs, the small to medium sized enterprises, but even from large companies. And Catherine uses Toyota as one of her examples in this interview. And that leads me to an announcement that came out just in a couple of days about a new partnership for liquidity. This is all about a liquidity partnership. And one of the companies, Ripple, through spring again, invested into back in June, 2019. The company is Alchemy. Alchemy creates a crypto asset liquidity superhighway. And this partnership is to drive efficient liquidity with depth. And Shift, the other company, is coming from the FX market and also the digital assets market, providing a brokerage platform. Listen to this. They have a program that has launched 100 new FX brokers and over 60 crypto exchanges around the globe. So this is a very, very big partnership. And when we look at some of that liquidity, uh, here is something that was tweeted out by at H-M-A-T-E-J-X. About 24 hours ago, this is the 20-day chart for the potential ODL flow that is happening, where you can see orange is the Philippines corridor and the blue is the Mexican peso corridor. It looks at quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four, and we are crushing it. You can see here that Dilip Rao in his kind of final farewell 
well, it won't be his final, but it was a farewell from Ripple tweet that he made just uh, yesterday where he is talking about the uh, expectation that we should all have that all 2019 targets will be crushed. And Dalip is going to, well, he deserves this break now because he's been working for over 40 years. He moved to Australia in 1984, and that is where he is going to spend his retirement. And also, too, Mark Travis, uh, who is a Ripple developer, he reminds us that Dalip closed the very first major bank deal for Ripple. And he responded, ah, oh, shucks, Mark, history now. The new sales team is killing it. So again, this is one of the reasons why I think everybody has their eyes on XRP. Even though we are not seeing it reflected in the price as of late, it is definitely something that is still changing and getting very, very prominent in this space. Okay, I want to go to the next story, and that is about utility. So we see here, as all of you know, that payments across borders is just one part of XRP's liquidity. The other is the real use cases driven by Spring. And this is all about um, a partnership they did with Forte. Spring accelerates XRP adoption. And ever since this was announced back on March 12th about the $100 million fund that Ripple brought to Forte, I have always been wondering, like, what is happening with this gaming industry, which is what Forte is all about. And you can see here that just in the last 24 hours, we have a more recent update. This is Brett Seiler of Forte, and he explains how games can run on blockchain. The gaming industry, $140 billion global industry, and most of it is a free-to-play business. It, that's the model that dominates right now, and it has grown through that model in the industry pretty much for the last 10 years. The game economy is deep, and it is complex. And most game teams or developers have to manage all these complexities. So what does a player want? And what are they willing to pay? And how do you manage the token and the risks that come with it? So can game developers build on blockchain to get through some of these complexities? Yes, blockchain can unlock, uh, unlock these platforms and it is able to equip them with the tools that run their economies through side chains, setting a floor on token value to offer a quality experience. And currently, many of these earned tokens or earned game currencies have no real market to sell into or to trade into. So, Forte. This is, this is finally, I'm getting what the picture is. Forte is leveraging ILP, the Interledger Protocol, to track in-game transactions. So this ecosystem needs also, of course, wallets, liquidity, and even market making. So the big vision here is to support all the digital game assets, the non-fungible tokens, NFTs as they're called, the earnable currencies, and even the unique items. So possibly moving these assets into other game economies. It's the, according to this article, utilizing the digital asset XRP to maximize cross-chain interoperability, security, and inter-asset liquidity. I finally get it. I finally get it. And it is a big deal. Okay, I am going to share with you that this Tuesday on the 10th, X spring or spring, I don't think it um, matters which way you say it, tomato, tomato, vase, or vase, the uh, launch of their event in San Francisco is going to celebrate the latest product. And looking at the developer tools and services to integrate money into those applications. And they're going to showcase a handful of XRP ILP developers. And Danny 
Aranda is going to moderate a panel and this is what you need to pay attention to. So who is on the panel? Because it is very telling what is happening here. The CEO of Forte, the CTO of Big Go. Big Go is out of Palo Alto and they provide that insured custody for digital assets. And then the third person is an investor, Alex Larson. He's part of Blockchain Capital. And then you have BRD, the president. He is, of course, running a company that integrates the exchanges and creates uh, <clears throat> fiat in ramps and off ramps. All right. So you've got the CEO of Forte. You have the custody solution. You have the money backed by a big VC, and you have the integration of fiat in and off ramps, creating an entire ecosystem for the gaming industry. It doesn't take very much to understand that this is developing into something very, very big. Okay, I'm gonna now move to regulation. So I think, yeah, this is just a part of the sales machine is killing it. What did I do? This is what I want to talk about. This is Augustine Carsons. He's the general manager of the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, and he's taking a brand new stand. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, I'm actually shocked at as, as to how fast he made this turnaround. The financial world is going through a revolution at the moment, as he says, and he definitely is feeling that he's losing control and has put out the warning shot that everybody needs to adopt digital assets with an established specific standard. So finally, right? Finally, he wants to remain at the center of global payments, no doubt, people just cling to their power. Otherwise, they think they're going to fall back and the, quote, events will overtake them. So banks' future, uh, the bank's future is brighter, he believes, if they work together with the private sector. It's just really, really amazing. And this will happen if they give private sector innovators a solid base to build on. I just can't believe it, you know, because let me just show you what he said in a speech just last year. You can see he said that cryptocurrencies do not fulfill any of the three purposes of money. They are neither a good means of payment, nor a good unit of account, nor are they suitable as a store of value. They fail dramatically on all these counts. So I think, uh, well, gosh, he is just, you know, I think getting a lot of good coaching and I'll explain why. You can see here that the uh, information that came in this speech, in this 12 page speech, he says exactly, exactly what Brad Garlinghouse has been saying for years. And it begins with, in fact, the modern internet made it possible by adopting common standards to govern the way computers talk to each other. You might remember things like TCP IP protocol and the convention governing email addresses. These are now so commonplace that we forget them in everyday use. But in thinking about improving the payment system, they are important predecents to consider. This is exactly the mantra that has been coming out of Brad's mouth when it comes to how he explains what they are trying to do. They're trying to be the TCP IP protocol of payments. And I only need to go to the last final summary, the last paragraph, and it's really the um, bottom line of what he's trying to say. And just let me just read it here. Let me conclude by reiterating the importance of the central bank's role. We should all embrace innovation. What is important is how innovation is encouraged and applied. I have argued for central bank public goods as a means, means for a means of achieving better payment systems. Central banks provide core services that are unique to them, such as providing the unit of account, 
settlement finality, liquidity provision, and regulatory oversight, provided that the central bank can underpin the core of the repayment system, of the payment system, all types of payment solutions are feasible. The technology is secondary to the underlying economics, irrespective of technology, all solutions, all solutions ultimately, ultimately rely on central bank public goods. Whether you build a cabin, a house, or a skyscraper, the building will stand only if it has sound foundations. So he is just saying right there that provided that the bank can underpin the core of the payment system, all types of payment solutions are feasible. This is a complete turnaround. You can read through his speech. It's good. It is, uh, I think it's worth a read if you're interested in the regulation component of this space. Okay, everybody, I'm going to the fluff and I want to talk about something that is really deep culture. This is deep modern Japan. I'm going to talk about anime and two other components that make up how this culture is quite unique. So for anime, you can understand that it's short for animation. This is the hand-drawn craft, quintessentially Japanese, that also uses a computer. The second component is AKB48. The, this is an all-girls idol group that receives votes from their fans to be chosen to who stays in the group and also it dictates their rank. It's a social phenomenon and it has had the highest selling musical act in Japan in terms of singles sold. The other one is food. And so this is a koroke. Koroke is borrowing from a dish from France all the way back from 1887 for Japan when it was introduced. And they use, well, mashed potatoes, and you can find them in supermarkets, convenience stores. And in addition to potatoes, you sometimes will find that they're done with pasta, sometimes seafood, particularly shrimp. Shrimp is very, very popular for the um, inter inner ingredients. And of course, meat and vegetable kuroke as well. Well, I want to share with you, there has been a just beautiful, beautiful animation produced by McDonald's on the third of this month. It's the most heartwarming 30 second commercial I have ever seen that depicts the midwinter chill with three young women working on their uh, way in the city after work. And the, um, well, the flurries are falling, the ice crystals are glistening, and it is obviously a very cold night. What they did for the commercials, they used one of the voices of an AKB48 megastar. Her name is Atsuko Maeda. She has since retired. She's now married and has a child, but she is really a superstar here. And what they did is create this commercial that I'll put a link to down in the com in the comment section below. It is receiving about 1 million views per day since it went live and it was uploaded onto YouTube. And you can see an example of modern, deep Japanese culture. All right, everybody. Yeah, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.